Hi, I'm James and welcome to another video. Today we're looking at Little Cold Wars. Uh, now this is written by Tim Gow and Bertrand Plastique uh, and edited by Tim Curry. It's part of the uh, History of Wargaming project. Uh, I've got quite a few of these books now. Uh, some of them are really good from a nostalgia value. Some are absolutely excellent as actual historical artefacts. Um, and I'll be looking at some of these later on. Um, and some I've picked up just out of interest. Obviously one on the Cold War is always going to be high on my list. So what do you get? It's 124 pages long. Uh, with a few blank pages at the back you can use for notes. Um, now it's... Not exactly your Challenger 2 type rules. Um, we don't expect really complex uh, rules. It's designed for very much a HG Wells Little Wars approach, hence the title Little Cold Wars. Um, I'll talk about some of the mechanisms as we go um, and we'll look at some of the bits and pieces. So I, I've sort of picked up a few bits and pieces. Um, the first thing to say is it's actually intended for quite large figures, 132nd scale figures. Um, if you're my age, you'll probably remember the, the old Airfix British infantry and German infantry that were produced. That's the sort of thing that they're designed for. Um, it does note you can play it using smaller figures. Uh, quite a few of the illustrations in the book um, to show 172nd or 176th vehicles and figures. Um, there are quite, quite a few nice little photos in the book, black and white. Um, and there's even a couple of East German reenactors at the start, which I thought was quite a nice little touch. Um, now, to give you an idea, uh, 36 inches to the kilometre is the, the game scale. That would drop to 30 centimetres to one kilometre if you're playing in some of the other scales. Um, a stand of infantry, usually around four figures, represents a platoon uh, or a weapons platoon, something along those lines. Um, and one vehicle is roughly four to six vehicles. So, there is a slight discrepancy in that APC models um, are around 12 to 15, so enough to transport a Western style company. So, there is a little discrepancy there. Um, I've seen that before, and I don't think it's, it's, it's a major problem. I think it's fairly easy to get around that. Um, so, looking at some of the other bits and pieces, as I, as I said, I picked up a few bits and pieces as, as we look at it. Um, I quite like the, the sense of humour in the rules, I'll use a few examples of them, but section B8, smoke. Pop smoke and go left flanking. Standard British 1980s tactical doctrine for all conceivable situations. Yep, that's pretty accurate actually. Um, it also sort of talks about how to actually acquire it and they suggest going into the sort of the craft shop um, and looking for the stuff that's used to fill teddy bears um, and it says the, the typical quote is can I please have a bag of that stuff you used to fill the inside of teddy bears or other cuddly toy type products please this is the sense of humor in, in the in the in the game um, very tongue-in-cheek very relaxed fun set of rules um, for example the um, rules for air reconnaissance uh, bear in mind the size of the game, it's probably going to be designed, it's designed to actually play in the garden a lot of the time, or on a really big table. Um, for air reconnaissance missions, for each recce mission the player plots the route and the umpire, or if none, the enemy player, takes from a height of 60 inches a panoramic photograph using a smartphone or similar device. The photo can then be sent to the player's own device for analysis. If the recce aircraft is shot down, the photo isn't sent. I suppose you are going to get very realistic aircraft uh, and vehicle recognition out of that. You say it gives a good taste for the game. Um, further in the air section, in a large game, you may wish to engage the services of an air umpire. His briefing should be along the lines of, Chris, just make it up as you go along. You may, of course, have an air umpire who isn't called Chris, but we can't recommend it. Now, the rules themselves are very much the HG Wells type. It does actually involve throwing balls of paper onto the table, it involves dropping uh, business cards to simulate paradrops, um, you've got 
uh, to actually simulate the chance of hitting, you've actually got um, a chart where you drop darts from, a, from shoulder height onto it at arm's length. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of that. However, in all fairness to them, they have put a set of conversion rules in to do it with dice. Um, so that is in there. Uh, there's lots and lots of extra rules. We've got rules for things like sabotage and demolitions from special forces teams, uh, night fighting, large missiles. Uh, it says covering large mobile rockets, mostly on South Park carriages like Honest John, Scud, Frog, Lance and so on. It's included here for four excellent reasons. One, suitable models exist, for example the dinky Honest John and the Solido Frog and Pluton. Two, it's very silly. Three, it's fun. And four, you know you want to. Uh, does only cover the um, conventional versions of them, um, but I can, I can still see that's going to be, to be fun. Now the highlight of the book for me, um, which was actually, let's see what page number it started on, the army lists start and cost, start on page 48 and continue to page 101. So they take up a substantial part of the book and they are excellent. Um, they're very comparable uh, for those who remember the command decision game. Um, they use very similar levels there where you've got a stand as a platoon. So to give you an example you've got the US Army part and it's looking at the US Army in Europe um, and it talks about how many battalions of each type would be in it um, it talks about from 1975 they can be upgraded to include Dragon uh, anti-tank missiles which is built into the platoon uh, and it gives you figures for the armoured battalion, uh, a mechanised battalion, the late 70s airborne battalion, the air mobile battalion, um, the 1950s pentatomic battle group uh, which was dropped because it was too difficult to command uh, and a late 1950s airborne battalion before going into the US Marine Corps Marine Amphibious Unit. Um, quite a, a nice little set of lists in there uh, and you have similar ones for most of the others including some that you perhaps wouldn't expect. Um, the French are in there, the West German Border Guards are actually included which is quite a nice touch uh, and I've been looking at them and I might might look at some of them. Uh, Belgium, and it, it's a very nice touch in the Belgian list, which says we include a Belgian list for the following excellent reasons. One, one of the authors has a close affinity with that land, and two, it occurred to the other author that having acquired various British, French and German AFEs, he could assemble a vaguely Belgian force without any further expenditure. You can't fault that one. Um, so you've got some very nice lists, even ones that I haven't seen in many books, there's a Swiss army list and a Yugoslav army list. Um, so it, it's really nicely put together. Um, it gives you an explanation of how they put them together and they give an example of assembling it using the um, Canadian Royal 22nd Regiment Battle Group. So they've actually put that, that in. Um, and notes on where to actually source the figures from. Um, there's also a very nice table which I found very um, helpful. It actually tries to give you a few, just a couple of pages on real world doctrine and it actually gives you the frontages and depths um, of all of the different um, options for companies, battalions, regiment, divisions in different activities. So for example the Soviet uh, battalion on a defence frontage would have a frontage of 4 to 7 kilometres whereas the regiment would have 8 to 16. Very useful little bit of data. Um, and there's notes then on the British defence in depth, the American approach. They're a bit shorter, the British one's half a page, the American's about three quarters of a page. Uh, and then you move on to some scenarios. They start off with a very, very easy one, uh, where three companies of two T-55s, supported by a HQ group in either a Jeep or a BRDM, uh, attacking a British um, reinforced squadron of four chieftains and a striker um, and both sides of the possibility of air support uh, and it then builds up um, to some quite large battles um, for example uh, here we go the last one um, just to give you an idea you have the East German motor rifle regiment so you've got a full motor rifle regiment in BMP1s um, with 
uh, attached special forces. The special forces company Willie Sanger. Always nice to see them in. Um, you've also got a nice touch, a spy in a civilian car with rules for that. Um, with attached anti-aircraft battalions, guided missile companies. There's a Polish para battalion. Um, the 380th Heroes of the Proletariat. East German Motor Rifle Regiment. Um, and a fair degree of um, aviation as well. So you have all of that coming onto the table. Um, and that is actually up against a multinational task force. You've got American artillery, um, an American tank unit uh, uh, and infantry battalion. Uh, you've then got um, an immobile battalion, which looks like it's American as well. And then some attached uh, American equipment. So I'm not quite sure why it's in multinational because it does all look American to me. So as a book, it's great. As a game, it isn't my style. It's fast and it's it's furious. I, I, I've got no doubt on that. Um, but it doesn't quite appeal to me. But for the army lists uh, and some of the little nice little chrome bits on it, some of them might get skimmed off um, and added to Seven Days to the River Rhine. I'm going to have a look at that, see what we can put in, particularly things like night um, and things like that. So, grip book, good value for money, even if it's only for the army lists and the entertainment value in reading it. Hope that was useful and I'll see you soon for another review.